God, amen. Well, how y'all doing this morning? Let's all stand up one more time, man. Give somebody a pound that's sitting by you or that, you know, that, that came with you. Say, man, it's good to see you in the house of the Lord. Well, yeah, we can turn up some lights here. Praise God. You can be seated whenever you're done, man. It's so good to see everybody. I know we still have a lot of people traveling and, uh, you know, getting that last vacation in before summer's, summer's over. But you can, you can have a seat. Um, but how many of y'all know that we've been talking about life givers? And I want to say one thing, one more thing. Remember, before you go, man, make sure that you talk to somebody, meet somebody you don't know. With so many, um, with so much different growth. And, you know, like I said, I know we have people out of town, but we have a lot of people that are coming and, and just being here. So make sure that before you walk out of those doors, you get to know somebody. And maybe you've met, you've like shook everybody's hand, but maybe you haven't really talked to somebody, got to know their name or, or whatever. Just, man, make sure you do that because that's why we're here. We're for fellowship. The Bible says it's sweet fellowship. Amen. And, uh, you know, and it's good. To con you know, sometimes you may connect with some people more than others, and, you know, that's, that's understandable. But make sure that you, you reach out to everybody to, to make those connections because look beside you. Look to your right and to your left. These are champions. These are the people that it says in Proverbs that iron sharpens iron, you know. And so you get around these type of, of people, and, and, and they, they influence you. How many of you know that you're influenced when you step out of those doors and you are supposed to be an influencer so you get out but sometimes we get dull because, because we're pouring out and pouring out and pouring out. We come back in here and we have people that are sharpening us and influencing us and, 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 and helping us burn hot for Jesus. So anyway, make sure that you get to know some of those sharpeners. Amen. Praise God. It, it, some of the older generation might know what this is but a whetstone. Anybody know what a whetstone is? Two people. All right. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Something you sharpen a knife with. And that's what we are. Is we're, we're, we're literally whetstones for people that we can sharpen each other. You go out and you feel encouraged. You feel brightened. You feel like you're new, refreshed. And, of course, the, the Spirit of God and, and um, his anointing, that does it. it could, God will do that to you and for you in your own personal time when you're by yourself. But there's sometimes... When you need the corporate sharpening, somebody say the corporate sharpening, and uh, that's why the Bible says how beautiful it is when uh, brethren dwell together in unity, and it also says forsake not the gathering together of the brethren. In other words, there's an importance, there's a premium on getting together and sharpening, getting under that word and getting fed the word of God, praise God. How many of y'all believe that? Praise God. Amen. Well, give the Lord one more hand clap, and we're going to pray. Father, I thank you for anointing me this morning. You are anointing us all, Lord God. Anoint the words that are going to come out of my mouth, Lord. May they be yours and anoint the ears of the hearer, Lord. Anoint my ears too, Lord, even as I hear some of this stuff that, that you're saying through, through me, Lord Jesus. I pray that you'll anoint us all to receive, to be good ground. For your word is true, and it's for us, and it's in us, and it's power in our mouth. In the name of Jesus, and everybody said Amen and amen. Well, um, we've been talking about life givers. And I just want to say this, man. Um, some of y'all went with us yesterday to give out the school supplies. Thank you. Give, your, give those people a hand clap, y'all. Give them a hand clap. If you, went, so if you went with us, raise your hand really high. Raise your hand if you were out there on the streets. There some, there's some people in there. Yeah, y'all raise your hand. Don't, don't be shy back there. Thank y'all so much. This is what world changers look like, y'all. Um, it was the fastest outreach I think we've ever done. <laughs> we went there, and there was uh, at least 90 to 100 people standing in line. Um, we did an altar call, many of them, a lot of them, over half of them, I would definitely say way over half of them raised their hand and said, yes, I would like to pray that prayer to make Jesus my Lord. We prayed with everybody, then that we gave them diapers, school supplies and such, and then and then just prayer, prayer warriors just started praying for needs and people were crying and weeping and there were miracles happening. Um, and so just, I mean, it was, it was a great time. It was an amazing time. And so y'all are part of that. Many of y'all gave towards that. Um, many of y'all were praying for us. Thank you for praying for us. But God did it. And it all happened like literally, you know, in the matter of like less than 30 minutes. <laughs> it was just bam, bam, bam. And we had a couple of lingering um, ministering times there. But it was just powerful. Maybe at the end of service we can show a couple of pictures. I don't know. We didn't make a video, but we do have some pictures on that. But it would be great. But, but y'all are life givers. 
That's, that's what giving out, like, listen, we were giving out life preservers. And in, in, the, in the natural, here, uh, uh, Brian, can you get one of those um, school bags right there for me? Bring it up. In the natural, it looked like school supplies. But really, in the spirit, it was one of these, okay? In the natural, it looked like, okay, there's some, you know, paper and pencil. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate that, man. Y'all give Brian a hand clap. Isn't he so handsome? Man, look at him. <laughs> <Pretty much. laughs> That's my brother-in-law, so hey, uh, you know, we, we got to dig at each other a little bit. But anyway, this is just full of all kind of goodies, you know, and paper and notebooks and things like that. And that's fine. That, that's, this is just one of many different types of things that we use to give out to bring in the harvest. But it's not, it's not just the bag. This, it looks like this in the natural, it looks like this in the spirit. A life preserved. In other words, we're saving their life, and we don't apologize for it. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, would you mind if I pray with you? You know, I know we, you might not like Jesus, but I no, we never apologize for saying the name of Jesus. We never apologize. Now, I, I, I don't come across like, hey, you're so bad, and I'm so good, and, you know, like I'm haughty, but, but never apologize. You're bringing them life. Somebody say life. We're going to be doing that. On Halloween, listen, we do not celebrate Halloween, but we love to get people saved on Halloween. We don't go, we don't go in our house and we're like, oh, there's somebody at the door. Turn off the lights, turn off the lights. Ain't nobody here, nobody here. Stick your head in this, like this. Like, nobody's home. Oh, don't, don't celebrate Satan's day. I ain't giving Satan a day. No, no, not on my time. He don't get a day. He don't get a day. No, no, no. I, I ain't giving Satan a day. October 31st. I'm alive. I'm in cyber Texas. He don't get a day. And some people may be celebrating Satan on that day and all Hallow's Eve and all the history. I'm not going out and I'm not celebrating. But I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to celebrate Jesus. And I'm going to bring some bait. And we're going we're gonna to get thousands of dollars of candy. Praise the Lord. All the dentists over there are, you know, praying for me. We're going to bring truckloads of candy, and we're, there's going to be bait, and it's going to look like candy. Well, like, like I said, there'll be bags, not be bags, but loads of candy. It's going to look delicious, but in the spirit, this. And then Christmas time, we're going to celebrate Christmas. We're going to talk about how amazing Christmas is, and we're going to have musicals and everything. In the spirit, we're going to have, you know, snow, I don't know, whatever we're going to come up with this year and all this. But in the spirit, it's going to look like this. A life preserver. They're coming for fake snow. They're coming for candy. They're coming for school supplies. But they get life. Oh, but Pastor Lane, I don't think you should, you know, is that trickery? Is that, you know, is that, you know, no, man, I'm telling you what, man, the Bible says, you the Apostle Paul said when, uh, you have to come in and he, he used the language of the day to bring an unchanging, timeless message. And man, I love it, boy. And Jesus, Jesus was so unorthodox. He blew every religious wig off. Man, they couldn't even keep a wig around him. He would just blow it off every time because, because he was bringing a message that it, and it was clothed in something they'd never seen. But he was bringing this. They had been praying for it for 2,000 years, but they didn't recognize it. He was bringing life, and it's what they had wanted. And they wanted salvation, and they wanted spiritual awakening, and they wanted um, a deliverance and revival. But they were looking for it in all the wrong places, and, the, and he brought it, in, and he was bringing this, but they didn't recognize it. But I'm telling you what, we are called to be life givers just like Jesus. Somebody say, I'm a life giver. I'm a life giver. I'm a life giver. And this church is a life-giving church. Um, you just look around. You, you want to know what a, a Christian looks like? Just look around you. You want to know what a life giver looks like? Just look beside you. You, you want to know what a champion looks like? Just look beside you. Come on, wives and husbands. You better look at your husbands and wives. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I'm joking. Just look beside you because y'all are life givers. And we bring life Wherever we go, I'm going to read the our master text we've 
we've been uh, talking about these last, this is actually the fifth week, but um, th this, is, this is what Jesus began with, is what in the middle of his, and this is what he ended um, his, his earthly ministry as a human on this earth. Now the spirit of God and his spirit is here, is in us. Jesus is on the right hand of the throne. The father is on the throne, but his spirit is in us. But his last words, when he was on this earth, those 33 years as a man, his last words were also go and be life givers that was his words but let's go to our master text Romans 10 verse 13 through 15 this is what we've been reading for several weeks and this is talking about us and if, if there's no um, nobody telling the gospel if there's nobody inviting people to church if there's nobody giving life then how are people going to have life and be saved Romans 10 Verse 13 says, for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, that's a great, that's a whole other sermon right there, but that goes with everything. God doesn't, uh, doesn't say, okay, this group of people can be saved. That group of people cannot be saved. You have to do all these things and climb on this mountain and go on your knees on the glass. And then maybe if your good outweighs your bad, when you get to heaven, you might make it. Don't raise your hand, but has anybody ever had some of that theology be, being taught to you? No, listen, my Bible says in verse um, 13, it says, For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now then God will help you work out your salvation and he will help you become righteous. But listen, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not the people that look like you, but whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him who that they have not believed? So how are they going to be saved if they don't believe, okay? And how shall they believe if in him they have not heard? How are they going to get saved if they haven't even heard the first Christmas story? Somebody say amen. And how shall they believe in him who they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Somebody say, I am a preacher. I'm a preacher. A preacher is not just a, an occupation an occupational thing that you pick and, you know, I want to be a pastor or a preacher or, you know, so, no, listen, every single Christian that is breathing is a preacher. You preach with your, you preach with your actions and sometimes you preach with your words. Woo, I said we preach with our actions all the time and then about 20% of the time when we're talking, women, it might be more like 50% or 70%. But when we open our mouth, men, I'm talking, we need to open our mouth more, praise the Lord. But when we open our mouth, then we preach as well with our mouth. And so we are preachers because we are Christians and we have Jesus inside of us and we can't help it. Somebody say, I can't help it. I can't help it. I, I can't help it. I can't help it being who I am. You say, if somebody was to say, well, deny Christ, deny being a Christian, I, I can't do that because that's who I am. It's like me saying I'm not a human being. I just, I can't do it. I love Jesus, and I can't help but share the gospel. Say, we are preachers. Verse 15, and how shall they preach except they be sent? And that's what we're doing. We're teaching the word of God. We're sending out as it is written. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. I love that. I love peace, glad tidings, good things. And I just, that is the message of God. And that's what we bring. Somebody say, that's me. That's me. So we've read that, and we, and we go on, and we know, you know, we talked about the story of us, of the soldiers saving the, the uh the Jewish people in, in World War II going into those prison camps and, and they, how that, that scripture is like that, like how beautiful were the feet of those soldiers whenever the, the people in the concentration camp saw them, that they weren't coming to torture them, but they were coming to set them free. In that same spirit, we are called to set our generation free and our feet are beautiful because we're bringing them life. Somebody clap for joy and thank God on that. But I want to say this, so we've been talking about life givers, and, and, and I love this, you know, I've, I've been using, boy, I've, I've, we've got our money's worth on this thing right here, praise the Lord, Brother Jason. But that's, <laughs> I'm telling you. But I want to get it burned in our, in our vision, because so many times we can hear something, 
we can even do something, we can have, have an experience, but then years, you know, maybe days pass. And sometimes it's not just about time that passes, it's about situations that happen to us that, that kind of separate us from what God has spoken to us. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I mean, sometimes it could be like a year and, you know, things have been kind of going good and, and things have been happening right. And, and so you still got the, the word. We're still filled up. Uh, you know, like the Bible says, uh, uh, wineskins, new wine, we're filled up with, with, with the Holy Spirit. It's what that's talking about. But it's not necessarily the time. But sometimes hard times happen. And it could be, you know, 10 minutes instead of 10 years. But 10 minutes of hard times, sometimes it makes us forget what we learn and forget what we saw and forget what we know. And so I want this to be branded in our spirit and in our, and in our mind that this is who we are, even when we don't feel like it. Even when depression slaps us in the face, we can get back up and look and, and remember this. And no, 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 I am called to stand up and give life and to have life. And so I will not forget and so that's why I want us to get this because this is what we bring. This is what we carry. And so um, maybe it, it's not just necessarily about the time that passes, but the situations that we deal with. Do not forget who you are and what you bring to the table. Because when we know what we bring to the table, listen, Peter had no idea what he, brought to, what he was bringing to the table. That's why he denied Jesus three times. He was, he was shamed like many of us, right? Right? No, nobody here has ever been ashamed, right? Not only that, he was afraid because he knew that, those were, that Jesus was about to get crucified. And he was scared to death and almost involuntary because I knew that he did not choose. Like, it, it, was, it was not like he wanted to do this. But it was those fears and doubts were so strong that it was just almost involuntary. Like he, he gave into those because they were so strong inside of him. And he, even though he wanted, he, he, you know, he did choose. He could have chose to say no. But I'm just saying that it was so compelling that, that he went with those natural tendencies because he didn't know what he brought to the table. But there was a time where he did. He did, and he preached, he preached, and thousands got saved, and then, and then, you know, John and Peter, I believe, you know, were at the gate beautiful, and, and this dude was saying, you know, hey, alms for the, alms for the blind, and, and this, and, and uh, they came up to him and said, man, silver and gold, I don't have any change on me, but uh, let me tell you what I do have. He knew what he had, and he knew what he brought to the table at that time. And then he would walk through the streets a few chapters later and people would just want his shadow to pass. Oh, that's idolatry, Pastor Lane. Oh, that's bad. No, 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 that's the word of God. <laughs> I'm not trying to puff up necessarily a man or a woman. I'm just saying the spirit of God does these kind of things according to my Bible. And it says that even his shadow People would, people would, you know, and the Apostle Paul, you know, he would anoint handkerchiefs and give out. And, and I know that sounds kind of crazy and all that, but this is just the word of God. I'm just telling you that the, the, the power of God is real. And these people were hungry. And they didn't even, they said, he might not have time to lay hands on me. He might not have, and they were hungry for that. And so he might not have time to smile. He might, if I could just get in his shadow, and, because Peter knew what he brought to the table. He had this. He had this. He had the life preserver. And he knew who he was. A few days, a few, a few days before that, he had no idea. Like a month and a half before, he was just, he, he thought he knew. Because he told Jesus, man, I've let them all, they, they, they might all betray you, but not me, God. Not me. Oh, Peter, this Peter. None of us have ever felt it in that, right? I see halos everywhere. Not me, God. Let them all just go to hell. Just let them all die and go to hell. I will never. Oh, I will never. That's Peter right there. Same night. I mean, Jesus. And he said, really, Peter, before the cock crows three times, I mean, the crows in the morning, you're going to deny me three times. And I'm telling you, I could still with resolve see him saying, no, no, not me. I would never, I would never. Because, but the reason why he failed was not because he want to, wanted to. It was because he didn't know what he had. And he still had it. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't like Jesus didn't say, well, you don't know what you got. Well, forget you. I'm going to kick you out, boot you out. You know, messed up. You know. No, Jesus gave him grace. He had the life preserver. He just wasn't acting like he had it. And he didn't know, like truly know. 
But when he stepped out on the day of Pentecost, he knew. Spirit of God had, the, the, the Holy Spirit had come upon him and he was filled with the Spirit of God. And he came out and he said, I know in whom I believed. And I know what I'm packing. Somebody said, packing. I'm packing. I'm packing in the spirit. I am packing. Some of y'all saying I'm packing in the natural too, but I'm packing in the spirit this. I'm packing this. And when you dive into the ocean and you know that you are packing this, you are not fearful. You are not dreading. You are not, oh, wait, wait, backstroke. No, no, let me go back. No, you dive in because you know what you have and you're bringing life. Somebody say bringing life. I want to say this. This is so important because when we're talking about this, we're, a lot of times we're thinking about what we're doing to the world, for the world, a heart for the world. And that's first and foremost, we, we preach the gospel with no strings attached to help humanity, to, bring, to, to know him and to make him known, to love God, giving life, and we're losing life. I'm going to say that again. So many times we're looking for life without giving life, and we don't know why, but life is slipping through our fingers. What kind of life? Uh, physical life, our mental life, our spiritual power in life. It seems like it's slipping through our fingers because it's not found within ourselves. It's found when we give life. And that's what I want to say today. It's so important. When we bring life to the world, we give life to ourselves. When we bring life, now listen, we don't take the place of Jesus. Jesus gave us life. He breathed in our lungs. Um, we called upon the name of Jesus Christ and we were saved. Understand that. But, uh, but we have to get this realization that when we bring life to the world, we are bringing life fulfillment, peace, power, restoration, protection in our life. Now, my, my salvation guarantees me citizenship in heaven, but it does not guarantee me, me fulfilling my destiny on this earth because that's a choice. That's a choice. I'm going to say that again. My salvation in Jesus Christ, me calling upon the name of the Lord, the most important thing, the most important question I will ever ask her, the most important question in the history of existence is if we have, if, if we have made Jesus our Lord. And so that gives me citizenship in heaven. And, when, and I'm a citizen. I, we may be here now, but when we die, we're going there. If Jesus comes back before then, which I believe he is, but we are citizens in heaven, but understand that just because my citizenship is in heaven does not mean that I'm going to fulfill my destiny and be a happy, powerful, anointed Christian that reaches lives. Oh, but that doesn't make sense, Pastor Lane. I thought we we're supposed to just give a, a cheerleading pep rally and make everybody feel good. No, we won't bring truth. <laughs> we won't bring truth. And the word of God tells us that we have to obey Christ. And so when we give life, then we get life to do great things. No, we were to, after the, the outreach, this made me really think we're talking to Jason and Lizette about, you know, teaching the children and, and um, you know, teaching the word of God, but then worship. And it was like breathing in and breathing out. Like, which one's more important? than <laughs> Neither one. You know, breathe everything out and don't breathe in, you'll find out. Or, or breathe way in and don't breathe out. You'll find out real quick that both of them are very important. But when we give out, it's like breathing out. And then it gives us room to breathe back in. And then we give out, and then it gives us room to breathe back in. And when we don't give out, and we're not life givers, and we keep what we have to ourselves, and we're selfish, and we've all been there, and I've been there just as much as anybody, but we're selfish. What, what we have, we do have it. I'm not going to lose that because I don't give it out, but I'm not using it for its intended purpose on earth to bring it to somebody else. And when I hold my breath in, and I don't breathe back out, and I don't bring life to, and I don't outreach, I don't invite people to church, I don't, you know, ask anybody if they need prayer. I don't share the love of God and freely forgive and things like that, then I become like a stagnant pond with no outlet. The Dead Sea. Anybody ever been to the Dead Sea? 
Man, we go, I love it. You go there, and even, even Lisa can swim. And even Pastor Lisa can swim in the Dead Sea. Because it's impossible to drown. I mean, unless you just stick your head in you, you float. You just literally just float in there. And the, but nothing can live in there, though, because the salt and mineral content is so high that there's no life in the Dead Sea, hence the name, the Dead Sea. Why is it the Dead Sea? There's inflow, and there's little, there's rain. It's the lowest, uh, the lowest spot on the planet that's not in the ocean. It's actually under sea level, but it's, you know, land. And um, then you go down to the Dead Sea. But why is it dead? Why is there no life? Why, is, why can nothing live? Because there is no outlet. There, is, there, there are tributaries to it, but there is no outlet, and therefore there is only death. There is no life. And in our life, when we don't have an outlet, things will start to die. Joy, peace. Forgiveness. Boy, that's out the door. Pfft. Wife, you better straighten up, woman. You better not. Nah, I, don't, I, will get, I will get straightened up if I said that to my wife. But you better straighten up. No, let, forgiveness is something that we should freely pour out. And then it brings life. 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 But when we harbor all of it, man, they don't deserve to be forgiven. Oh, 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 really? <laughs> I, I suppose you deserve to be forgiven. I'm talking to myself. I'm looking to myself right now. But it's like when we keep that in and we keep this to ourself and we're like, no, but I, my personality is not like, no, it's not about personality and characteristics. It, it's about who we are deep down inside because there are people that, all, that, that, that God, you are tailor-made to reach. Can I say that again? There are people that you are tailor-made to reach. I've had people that hated, uh, you know, whenever we went to Family Faith Church and we were the youth pastor, they hated Pastor Jeff, but yet we would bring them and they liked us or like somebody else and then they would get saved and they would start liking because because we brought them in. They've had, and because there are different people that are tailor-made. There's people that love the preacher, but, you know, and, and he draws that there are people that will love you but never step foot in here and that they are tailor-made for you to reach. The they brought's. Remember the they brought's? They brought to Jesus. They brought to Jesus. They brought to Jesus. And, you know, and, and, and remember Junebug, Junebug went and he went, the, the demoniac, that, a.k.a. Junebug, which I, I, you know, nicknamed him that. He went out and he became a they brought and people started connecting with him because it was a miracle and he was a lunatic and now he was in his right mind and they connected with Junebug. Because I don't want to call him the demoniac anymore because he's not. But anyway, that's just a, saying how great of a testimony he had. But he went out and they, they, they loved what had happened to him. But they didn't want anything to do with the move of God. But yet he went out because Jesus said, they don't want to follow me, Junebug. And they actually kicking me out of their nation. But, but I'm, I need you. Isn't that what it said? And remember we read that? I need you. Because Junebug said, you know, the demoniac said, I, I want to follow you wherever you go. Jesus, that's me. That's me. Jesus and Junebug, like we are, we are the dynamic duo. I just follow. I don't even have to say nothing. Just let me just go. And Jesus said, no, I need you here because they don't like me. And they're afraid of me. And they don't even know who I am. But your story will compel them. Man. And so let, let us never say that, oh, I'm too shy, I have too bad of a past, or I have too good of a past, or, or I'm too, they, listen, you are tailor-made to reach people in this generation. But just like Peter, we got to know what we bring to the table. When we bring life to the world, we give life to ourselves. Anybody ever been trained in, you know, CPR? Two people. I like back thirty years ago. I was. I think you know. Please don't need it around me. I I pray for you. No, but I was trained a long time ago. I, in Jesus' name, I'll remember it. But CPR. That's funny. See, that's hilarious. Anyway, CPR is when you actually bring your breath and put it in their lungs. Is that is that right? Any medical people in the medical profession here, maybe nurses, anybody? Anybody just think that they want to pretend to be? No, I'm joking, I'm joking. 
But is that correct in saying that whenever you, of course, you're pumping their chest and then you take the breath that is in your lungs and you breathe it into their lungs and they use your breath. And sometimes it doesn't, they don't catch on the first time. Sometimes they don't catch on the second time. And sometimes it takes a while. But there are times where they, they take that, that breath and that oxygen that you have breathed into their lungs. And then they take it and they begin, and you pump their heart and you help them and you give them a little teaching, a little revelation or your, a shot of your testimony. And then it, and it revives them and they take the breath that you took and you breathe in them and then they breathe it out and then they breathe back in on their own. But if I don't take the breath that I have, Romans 10, if there's no one to preach, how are they going to hear? If there's no one to give CPR, how are they going to be revived? How, if there's no breath breathed in their lungs, how are they going to be saved from hell? Man, that's good preaching, Pastor Lane. Jesus, that's, that's some good stuff. I want to read this, though, and, uh, because I love reading, I love memorizing Scripture, and I love meditating on the Scripture and breaking it down. But sometimes we're, I'm going to throw myself in this category, we're all good at taking a scripture and quoting it and breaking it down, but, but not really seeing what it was said in the midst of the, like what was said before, after, who was saying it, why were they saying it, what, what, what was the point that they were trying to get across, what was the sermon that they preached. Like if I'm preaching all this sermon this morning and you might take one quote, well that might be a great quote, but there might be what was said in the stories that were around it really brought more understanding. Does anybody understand what I'm saying there? So I want to do a deep dive. Somebody say deep dive. In the Luke 6, um, I want to read this one scripture in the middle, and then I'm going to expand it a read a little bit more. Because we always read this. And a lot of times we, we read Luke 6, 38 in, you know, offering times. And, you know, it's very appropriate. And it's, it's a law of God. And, and the laws of God and the, and the spiritual laws you can use bosom okay for with the same measure that you meet with all it shall be measured again unto you so let's read it in the amplified give and it will be given unto you they will pour into your lap a good measure pressed down shaken together and running over with no space left for more I love that for with the standard of measurement you use like selflessness love forgiveness or money, when you do good to others, it will be measured to you in return. Man, that's some good stuff. I mean, boy, that's like slap the devil. I mean, I'm sorry, Lisa don't like me saying that, but that's like really powerful stuff right there, okay? But I want to read a little bit about this because this is what Jesus, this whole chapter, it, you know, he's, at the beginning he's talking about um, um, blessed are the, uh, you know, he talks about the Beatitudes, blessed are the people basically that are humble and hungry and, and needing God. And, and he goes through that and then he gets some woes, don't act like this. And then he goes and he gives a whole sermon on how to give life. Life givers. Somebody say life givers. He gives a whole sermon on how to give life. And uh, it's, let me just start in verse 27. It's all so good. And I'm going to read this whole story in NIV. It just helps me flow a little bit better here. It says the same, the same thing. In verse 27, it says, but to you, Jesus is talking, talking to the people there, the masses. He's talking to us today. But to you who are listening, I love that. When Jesus said, like, verily, verily, hey, listen, if you got ears, check this out. He said, to those who are listening, in other words, if you want to hear what I'm really saying, Listen to this. <laughs> Listen to this. But to you who are listening, who are willing to take the words that I'm saying and take them to heart, check this out. Love your enemies. You want to curse you. Are you sure, God? Are you serious, Jesus? Um, you know, are you just, you're just preaching right now. I know you really don't mean that. Yes, he said, hey, listen to what I say. Bless those that curse you. Pray for those that mistreat you. Are you sure about that, Jesus? If someone slaps you on the cheek, turn to meddling. 
If someone slaps you on the cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Jesus, what kind of doctrine are you laying on me right now? What are you talking about? How to give life. How to be a life giver. If someone takes your coat, don't withhold them the shirt. In other words, the shirt off your back. Mm, that's good. Give to everyone who asks you it. And if, if anyone takes what belongs to you, don't demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. We like to quote that, but we don't like to go to the previous verses, do we? The golden rule. Well, the golden rule had some things that came before it. How do we give life? How do we get life? How do we get peace back? How do we have power and anointing? How do we get life breathed back into our lungs? We give life by doing this. We give life by doing this. Give to everyone who asks you, verse 30, and if someone uh, takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. How many times have we misconstrued that, well, if I was in their shoes, well, you don't even know. The world does that. Pharisees do that. The scribes, the Romans do that. The Romans, but how do I give life and open people's eyes to the greatness of God and his love and mercy and save them from an eternal hell and bring them joy and peace unspeakable? How do I do that? Okay, I'm glad you asked. Let's continue to read. If you love those who love you, what credit is that of you? Even sinners love them that uh, love who love, th love them that love them, love those that love them, excuse me. And if you do good to those that do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those who, um, from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners, lend to, even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. This is how we do it. This is how we give. Love your enemies. Do good to them and lend to them without expecting anything back. Then your reward will be great. And you will be children of the Most High. Mm, that's good. Because His is uh, because he is kind to the ungrateful man and the wicked. But Jesus, they don't deserve it. They don't deserve to be forgiven. They don't deserve to, listen, Jesus said, be kind to the wicked and the ungrateful and the people that would slap your hand and say, I don't even want that. What are you talking about? Be kind to them. Whoa. How to be a life giver. This is Jesus' sermon. This is not my sermon. This is Jesus' sermon. I'm just quoting what he said, okay? Whew. I, man, it's just like, I just got a sea lot and says, sit there back for a second. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Do good to them and lend to them without expecting anything back. In other words, love with no strings attached. Give with no strings attached. Forgive with no strings attached. Show honor. Oh, you don't honor me? Well, I'll see how that, see how that works out for you, you know, because I, you ain't getting none from me. I'm going to give you the silent treatment until Jesus comes back, and maybe even in heaven, if you make it. I'm not, you know, I mean, we just go on and on. Nobody here would ever say that. But, but Jesus said, be kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. How do you give life? You got to quote the whole Bible? Well, it's good. We, we need to read the Bible and, and we need to study to show ourselves approved. But don't disqualify yourself from being a life giver until you have taken four years of Bible college because that is a lie from the pit of hell. You are a life giver right now. Those children that just walked out the door are life givers. And they will always be life givers. And we're training to send out and we're training to be life givers but don't disqualify yourself because you don't think you have made some man-made prerequisite to invite somebody to church to pray the prayer of salvation with somebody to um, bring somebody to Jesus to shine the light of Jesus to be called the righteousness of God listen those are not earned those are given freely 
How do we give out life? Listen, how do we do it? Just do what Jesus said. Jesus said, man, if you got ears, just listen. Just listen to what I have to say. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. You want to turn some heads? You want to turn some heads and, and, and have some people start to grab onto your life preserver? And you want to be able to share Jesus and have some effectiveness? Be merciful. Just as your father is. I thought God was a judge. Well, you know, uh, there, we have to read the whole word of God. Yes, he is a judge. But he's a merciful judge. And he's made a way for everyone. Oh, man, that's so merciful. So good. 37. Y'all want to go? Y'all want to go more? Y'all want to hear some more? Jesus, how do we become life givers? How do we bring life back into it? I'm glad you asked. Verse 37 said, do not judge. And you will not be judged. Do not condemn. And you will not be condemned. And that word right there actually means to judge means to place a sentence of punishment. How many of y'all have judged? I know I have. I mean, none of y'all, you don't have to raise your hand or nothing. I'm just talking to myself. I've, I've laid a sentence of punishment like that. Yeah, that person deserves this before I even talk to them. I just saw something on Instagram, and, and I know everything about them. And I lay a sentence, <laughs> guilty. <laughs> That's right, they are guilty. And without Jesus, they'll die and go to hell. But it's not my place to pronounce that. It's my place to come in and help them. And yes, I bring, I, we will judge as saints. We will judge this world. But I don't want to judge them and send them to hell. I want to be judging them and saying, I, I brought you to Jesus. And so the judgment is you are righteous. That's what I want. I don't take joy in pronouncing, wait, that person's going to hell. That's not, that's not, listen, I have, we have the judgment of Christ inside of us, but understand we don't place sentences of punishment on somebody. That's not my place. At least that's what Jesus said. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Does that mean that we need to agree with everything that happens in this world? Absolutely not. But it's not our job to place. If we want to bring life, we have to show them a way out. We have to, yes, say, man, listen, without Jesus, there's no hope. Boom. So they know they're in the water because Satan's saying everything's great. You're on a cruise line right now and nothing's wrong. We got to open our eyes that you are dying and sinking, okay? But there is a way out. And his name is Jesus. And that's what Jesus told the Pharisees. He said, man, you lay these heavy burdens on these people and you don't give them any way out. You're not giving out life preservers. You think you are, but you're not. You're just, listen, you're guilty yourself. That's what Jesus said. But he said in this particular passage said do not judge and you will not be judged do not condemn and you will not be condemned forgive and you will be forgiven how do you give life you forgive and you will be forgiven back it comes back to you give verse 38 that's where that verse comes into play give what forgiveness what, what else did he say compassion kindness what else did he say um you know help the poor what else did he say don't condemn um all this stuff that he said give that and and you know give of our life and our finances give and it will come back to you be given unto you a good measure pressed down shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap for with the measure you use it will be measured unto you remember cpr you're giving life and they take that breath and it becomes life in them and they breathe it out. But then you breathe back on your own after you have given out what is inside of you. You breathe back life inside of you. Why? So that you can breathe it back out again. We breathe life in this church. We breathe life on Tuesday nights when we come and worship. We breathe life when we get the word of God. We we breathe life when we're sharpening each other. Iron sharpens iron. And we're, we're breathing life. We're breathing life. We're breathing life. But what if we don't breathe it out? We're like, we walk out the door like this. Come back out the door like this. We're going to pass out eventually. Because we breathe in life for the sole purpose to breathe it back out. I said we breathe that. Now, 
what does oxygen do? Well, you breathe in life and then it brings oxygen to your lungs and it brings life to your vitals and then all your organs work and everything else. So if you don't, bring it, if you don't breathe life in, then your organs are going to shut down and so you must breathe it in, but you also must exhale and that's what we do when we bring life to others. Somebody say, I'm a life giver. I'm fixing to close here, y'all. This is some good stuff, but it's so hard to get through all of this. It's so powerful. And he told him this parable. Ooh, can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into a pit? A student is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. So in other words, Jesus is saying, there's so many people blind that think that they're teaching um, how to be a Christian, but they're not giving anything, and they're not bringing life. And he says, if you're not bringing life to somebody, and you're showing off that you're a Christian, then you're both going to wind up in the ditch, you and them, because they need life, and they need to breathe in, but you need to breathe out. But if I'm not breathing out, then how can they breathe in? And we're both going to wind up late in the ditch, because we have to learn this concept that we can't lead somebody blindly without being a giver. When we're selfish, we're blind. That, what is that? When we're selfish, we're blind. When we keep the life to ourselves, we become blind and stagnant like the Dead Sea, and we cannot lead anyone anywhere. They don't want to follow us, but even if they did, they'd wind up dead because we have no life to offer. But when we breathe out and we are unselfish, even when we're scared, even when we're fearful, even when there's hatred and bitterness inside of us and we're like, you know, I know I'm mad. I know I'm fearful. I know I'm battling depression and all this, but I will choose to be a life giver and open my eyes and lead somebody that is blind so that I can breathe life into their lungs and so that they can be resuscitated and their spirit can come alive and then they can say, oh, that's what you meant. That's why you wanted me to come to church. That's why you were telling me all these times and all these years about Jesus. I see it for myself because you breathe your breath into me with your forgiveness, with your smile every day, with your, with, with, with your joy, with your passion for Christ, with, with your unwavering. Even when you fell and messed up, you still got back out. And you, and you still got back up and you showed me that that's what Christianity was about. And so I breathe, we breathe life into their lungs by showing them and giving them and praying for them and being a Christian in front of them and then they will eventually wake up and breathe on their own and say thank you and he says this is so good why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye the King James says the beam in your own eye but this is interesting because, you know, in, in the, the previous verses, it says, judge not lest you be judged. So we don't need to judge. But here, a lot of times we stop right here and say, okay, we don't need to look at the sawdust in somebody else's eye because we have a plank in our own, so we just don't. Do but it says, okay, let me instruct you. Jesus said, yes, you are called to, to, to take the dust out of their eyes so they can see clearly, but let me tell you how. First, don't be a hypocrite and take the own plank out of your eye. Then not judge, not want to put a sentence of condemnation with a penalty, uh, of a, a penalty sentence and a punishment, but to help them, let me take this blindness, blindness off of your eyes so that you can see. My goal is not for them to be punished. That's why Jesus said, uh, judge not lest you be judged, condemn not lest you be condemned. My goal here is not to punish somebody. My goal here is to, to take the blindness off of their eyes so they can see for themselves. Somebody clap for joy and thank God right there. How then can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. Now, this is Jesus talking. It's not me. I'm just quoting Jesus. You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye or the beam out of your own eye, and then you can see clearly to remove the speck 
from your brother's eye. In other words, Jesus is saying, you know what? The worst thing is is whenever you have a beam and you walk in condemnation, that's way worse than the world because they don't even know me. And they're dead and they don't even know how to breathe. And so it's way worse for you and it's way more blind for you to walk around and for us to walk around and say we are better than them and they are not worthy. Jesus is comparing this and saying that's a beam. That's a big old plank. That's like a big old two by four sticking out of your head. Can you see that? But I don't blame the world because they don't even know me. You have to bring me to them. And yes, you need to go to them and help them see and remove the blinders from their eyes. But first, you have to remove the what? Selfishness. Remove the selfishness, lane, and want what's best for them. Not judgment.